is podcast number 10 in my series on how to understand the Apostle Paul. So we've just finished Paul's artistic language to persuade the Jewish and Gentile believers in Galatia to listen to his argument. He hasn't given his argument yet. He's just, so far, he's just softened them up. And very frankly, trying to understand that artistic language is really hard for us because we don't think that way. You know, we think in a, in a kind of a Western scientific way. Um, we want somebody to tell us what they're talking about. Paul doesn't do that. He gives us clues so that we go, we either think about it or we discuss it with others or we go into the Hebrew scriptures to discover it. He's not going to just lay it out for us. And that, that makes it hard for us to understand. What I'm going to do is I'm going to first introduce the Midrash that's coming. The Midrash is an entirely different method, and it has literally rules of how to draw out hidden meaning from Scripture. I'm going to start with my own introduction, and then I'm going to give you Paul's introduction. Paul's introduction you will find in Galatians 3 verses 1 through 5. But let me start with my introduction. I'll try to make it so you can understand it. So, one author has written, it is indeed startling that one passage can be interpreted in such radically different ways. And he's referring to these passages that are Paul's Midrash, which I don't think the Christian community has understood. I really don't think so. I think I'm on the cutting edge of proposing this as Midrash and explaining how this Midrash works in Galatians. So what's causing the problem? Well, we're faced with a troubling dilemma. The Midrash is going to occur in Galatians 3, verses 6 to 14, when Paul suddenly cites six different verses from the Hebrew Scriptures, but his conclusions seem disconnected from the citations. So we ask, what is the nature of Paul's argument? Equally unsettling is the sudden appearance of what seems to be an anti-Jewish statement in the midst of these verses. Does Paul really mean the law is a curse? Meaning either the Hebrew scriptures or the laws that are written, not only in the Holy Scriptures, but also in the Oral Torah. And is Paul telling us that those Jews who rely on the law instead of believing in Yeshua are also under a curse? Because in these verses, we're going to hear the phrase, the curse of the law. The challenge of understanding the passage seems directly related to a correct identification of the method Paul is using to draw meaning from the Hebrew scriptures. Although attempts to understand Paul's method of argument have led to a bewildering array of possibilities, there is one element of consensus. All proposals rely on the plain or literal meaning of Paul's words. And remember how some people take the literal meaning and then jump to conclusions? (laughs) Uh, But they start with the literal. The unfortunate result is what some have observed as a density of Paul's logic. In other words, they don't really understand it. I mean, you can draw some conclusions from the literal words, but if you realize that there's more to it than that and you don't know the method of Midrash, then you look at it as density of Paul's logic and a maze of labored exegesis, puzzling illustrations, and cryptic theological shorthand. That was one author writing. However, if Paul is using methods of halachic midrash, which I am going to call legal midrash because halach is a hard term, but it, it, it's legal midrash is what it is. It's midrash that is pulling out hidden information Um, in the form of new laws. So if Paul is using methods of legal midrash in these verses, then the plain meaning of the words is simply not what he intends. Whereas artistic manipulation plays with the language to prompt an emotional response, which is what we've seen previously, legal midrash is a different method that penetrates the plain sense of the Hebrew scriptures to uncover deep and previously hidden meaning. People at the time of Paul believed that God had embedded veiled meaning in scripture that could be uncovered by these methods of legal midrash. Well, the Pharisees believed that. The Sadducees didn't, but the Pharisees did. And Paul was a Pharisee. 
Paul has now finished his introductory and emotional artistic manipulation of language, which has been preparing the Galatian believers, as he is preparing all of us today, to hear his exciting discoveries from Scripture. Paul is ready to disclose how God has blessed the Gentiles, the fulfillment of a promise God made to Abraham more than a thousand years before the time of Paul. And Paul has learned how God's promise of the Spirit is operating through faith in the Messiah. You know, we just take it for granted that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, but Paul's going to explain how. Paul is ready to unveil to the Galatians not only the new understanding he has uncovered, but also he's found it. Paul must convince the Galatians of these exciting discoveries from Scripture. But were the Galatians prepared and ready to hear something that countered their tradition? Paul fervently hopes so. But here comes the big question. Are you ready to hear something that will undoubtedly counter your tradition? We'll see. So I'm going to begin by listing three frequent usages of the term midrash as used in our own modern world. The first is not commonly recognized, but it is the way I use the word Midrash. When I talk about Midrash, I mean methods of ancient exegesis that penetrate the Hebrew scriptures for deep meaning that resides behind the plain and simple words. These methods of Midrash were definitely in use during the Second Temple period, which includes the writings of Paul, and we can see that from the Talmud. The second use of the term is commonly employed in Judaism today. For many Christians, it is also their traditional understanding of Paul's use of the term law. The second way using the term midrash refers to conclusions that have been drawn by using exegetical methods to lift previously hidden meaning from the Hebrew scriptures. These conclusions were collected in the oral Torah and were subsequently recorded in the Mishnah. The third use of the word refers to books of Midrash in the Talmud, and I think most Jews think of books of Midrash in the Talmud and the specific works they contain. These books of Midrash were composed approximately four to 600 years after the time of Christ, but may reflect some earlier traditions. We will proceed in this study to employ the word midrash exclusively as methods of ancient exegesis that uncovers previously hidden meaning from Scripture. Now, as I introduce you to legal midrash, Let me begin by comparing Hebrew artistry of language, which you've been doing in the past, that's persuasion, with legal midrash. This kind of the persuasion that we saw earlier may have appealed to both Jews and Gentiles in the ancient world because of its affinity to the manipulation of words that is characteristic of Greek rhetoric. The purpose of Greek rhetoric was to persuade. And Paul has used methods of persuasion. They're not exactly Greek rhetoric. He's added Hebraic thought to Greek rhetoric, but the foundation is is Greek rhetoric. However, legal midrash required skilled knowledge and extensive practice of various rules of legal logic that uncovered hidden meaning from the holy writings. That's why it's so hard for us to understand, because it really was an advanced form of instruction, and Paul would have received it because he was at the school of Gamaliel. But most Jews, and certainly the Gentiles, didn't understand the mechanics of Midrash. I mean, they could hear the conclusion, like you get in the Mishnah, but they didn't understand the mechanics of it. Techniques of legal midrash would only have been familiar to those who were skilled in its intricate methods. Paul had acquired these skills when he attended the Beit Midrash in Jerusalem that was the school of Gamaliel. But what about the Galatians? 
Certainly the Gentile believers in Galatia would have found the logic of Paul's argument unfamiliar and strange, just like we do today. As for the Jewish believers who were in Galatia, their level of training is unclear, but they too may have been inexperienced in the sophisticated complexities of legal midrash since few Jews acquired this advanced training. The Jewish believers in Galatia would most likely have been versed only in the final rulings of the Jewish oral law, not in the mechanics of the methods that led to those rulings. So if Paul is just going to give conclusions, they're not going to believe him because they're so steeped in their tradition, the Jewish Christians, and they're teaching that what their traditions to these Gentile believers. So if Paul just gives the conclusions, I don't think he's going to get believed. So Paul's discoveries of veiled meaning in the Hebrew scriptures were, were not part of the oral law. They could be added to the oral law. Actually, they weren't because the, the oral law was Jewish and, you know, and, the, and the Jews dismissed anything to do with Christianity. But Paul is adding to that kind of understanding that you get in the oral law. Perhaps the untested originality of Paul's legal rulings encouraged him to present not only his final conclusions, which we're going to see, but he also actually lays out the logic and methods that led to his conclusions. Now, that's not going to be easy to understand because Hebraic logic is very different from our Western traditions, which come from the Greeks, not from Hebrew. What about Christian believers who read Galatians today? That's us. That's me. That's probably you. Like the ancient Galatians, we're going to be faced with something unfamiliar and strange. And probably even Jewish believers will be faced with something unfamiliar and strange because they have the result of Midrash as laws in the Mishnah. The Mishnah does not give the mechanics of how the conclusions were drawn. But that's in fact what Paul does in his letter to the Galatians. So given Paul's need to persuade his readers about the conclusions that he has drawn, which were going to unsettle the comfort of Jewish tradition that Jewish believers were teaching to their Gentile brethren, Paul does not merely declare the veiled and hidden meaning that he's uncovered from Scripture. That is, he does not record his conclusions as laws. Instead, he leads his readers through his legal midrashic reasoning to carry them together with him to the dramatic and exciting new meaning that he has uncovered from the Hebrew scriptures. Paul's way of thinking is a very different way of thinking from ours. So I'm going to do my absolute best to explain it to you. It took me a long time to figure it out. But first, let me share how I discovered this legal midrash in Paul's epistle to the Galatians, which was really quite by accident. <laughs> I was reading everything I could find about midrash because I was intrigued by the thought of ancient methods that uncovered deep meaning from Scripture. However, nothing I read applied to Paul's letter to the Galatians, my particular area of interest. Furthermore, what I was reading made little sense to me <laughs> because of my weak, although growing, background in Hebraic exegesis. That is, until I stumbled on Menachem Elon's single volume, subsequently expanded to four volumes, entitled Hebrew Law. I was drawn to this textbook that Menachem had composed for Israeli law students, now translated from Hebrew to English, thank goodness. Tackling it in Hebrew would have been difficult for me because it's so academic. Um, but I was able to read the English translation. Uh, Menachem explains the ancient historical background that forms the foundation of modern Israeli law. I was attracted in particular to Elon's careful explanation with relevant examples from the Talmud of Hillel's seven rules of legal midrash. Hillel was the grandfather of Gamliel, and Gamliel was a Pharisee, so was Hillel. Gamliel was Paul's teacher. So Hillel presents seven rules. These seven rules were later expanded to 13 by Rabbi Yishmael. 
After all, I reasoned, Paul studied under Gamaliel, and he lived between the times of Hillel and Rabbi Yishmael, so I decided to consider a possible connection between Paul's six citations of the Hebrew Scriptures in Galatians 3, 6-13, and Hillel's seven rules of legal midrash as expanded to 13 by Rabbi Yishmael. Others before me must have tried also, but perhaps I was more persistent because I couldn't find anything in any of the literature that pertained to Galatians. I worked doggedly, really, for several years. Eventually, I began to capture bits and pieces until finally they started to coalesce into a larger and more complete picture. My current challenge is to draw you in also as you listen to Paul's logical Hebraic explanation of the way he conducts his legal midrash. I trust you will be excited as I was and as the ancient Galatians must have been, when Paul leads you through his reasoning from Scripture to his final breathtaking discoveries. Now, in order to understand Paul's legal reasoning from Scripture, you must first perceive the historical situation that prompted his need for legal midrash. Why was it necessary for Paul to turn to Scripture for answers to puzzling questions? What were these driving questions? How did the plain sense of Scripture, that is the literal meaning, fail to answer Paul's questions? After we understand the historical situation that prompted Paul's search in the Hebrew Scriptures, only then can we begin to perceive the logic of his argument as it relates to that situation. A narrative snapshot of an unusual circumstance in Galatia offers a glimpse of the historical setting. We see that those Galatians, including even the Gentiles who had not been circumcised nor did they know the holy writings, which is the law, Paul conveys this situation by asking rhetorical questions about the experience of the Galatians. Now we get into Paul's introduction to, to his Midrash, and that's going to be in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Paul asks four rhetorical questions questions which demand answers. He doesn't give the answer. He just asks the question, and everybody knows the answer. And they're organized in a classic chiastic pattern of parallel lines in an A, B, B, A construction. The A lines are parallel, connected by the repetition of works of the law or hearing by faith. The B lines are parallel by the concept of mankind's lack of spiritual power without God. In a sense, The B parallel lines are as empty of power to enlighten us as the repetitive words in vain convey an empty waste of spiritual strength. The key to understanding the situation that prompted Paul's legal midrash emerges in the A parallel lines. So we will read the A lines first and then the B lines. Okay, here come the A lines. A1. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Well, they don't know the law yet. So, of course, they received it by hearing with faith because they don't know the law. And the, a, the second A line, does he then who is supplying the Spirit to you and is working miracles among you do this by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And the answer is it has to be by hearing with faith because they're, do, they're doing miracles and they don't know the law. So how can they be doing miracles by knowing the law? Paul starts in the first A line by asking, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? The Galatians knew the rhetorical answer. We received the Spirit by believing what we heard. But this answer presents a problem for modern readers. The Galatians must have known from their own experience that they had received the Spirit. We can only guess what those experiences might have been, but one thing is certain from the rhetorical question and its implied answer, somehow the Galatians experienced the power of the Holy Spirit as a result of believing what they heard. We turn now to the second A line. Does he then who is supplying the Spirit to you and working miracles among you do this by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Note the double expansion that the rhythm in the words of the second parallel line have accomplished. First, we learn the source of the Spirit. The Galatians have received the Spirit from the one who is supplying it to them. I love the use of the same word, 
translated supply. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, now the one God thoroughly supplying, okay, that supplying is, is our word, and supplying two things, seed of sowing, number one, and number two, bread for eating, and then again, will supply, that word again, and multiply your seed for sowing, which means both seed of plants and also descendants or offspring, because uh, descendants are called seed in scripture, and will cause to increase the fruit of your righteousness, again, a double meaning of literal food harvest and spiritual harvest. So we've got this supplying, God is supplying. He's supplying the Galatians with the ability to do miracles. And in, in 2 Corinthians, he's supplying seed for sowing and bread for eating. It's something that God gives to us to enable us to do something. The silent rhetorical answer to Paul's second question in, in the A-line would now be thundering in the silent thoughts of the Galatians as it is also echoing in our minds. We hear, does he then who provides you with the spirit and works miracles among you? And we can answer silently in our minds, the one who supplies us with the spirit is working miracles among us. This is how Paul is introducing his, his Midrash. But there is still another important unanswered question. How do we perform miracles in order to do the work of expansion? Here we note in the second A line, not an expansion, but a repetition. We work miracles not by the works of the law, but by hearing with faith. Paul will develop this concept of faith in the verses following this passage. So we turn next to the B parallel lines, which present a stark contrast to the Spirit working miracles among you. We read, Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Perfection of the flesh is a powerful metaphor that conveys an image of fleshly alteration caused by circumcision. Thus, Paul uses perfecting the flesh ironically to project a graphic negative image of the rite of circumcision. Who performs the rite? A priest performs the rite, not God, who commanded his practice. What is the immediate result? Well, the result is pain and blood. And what's important, though, is the symbolism of circumcision. The symbolism is that it removes the flesh which represents worldly sins. Paul is playing artistically with the concept of fleshly circumcision because Christ has brought something better. Thus, the incisive irony that Paul was using in his earlier artistic language continues in these verses. Here, the particular form of irony is, well, we could call it sarcasm, but very frankly, it sounds like ridicule to me. In our modern Western culture, sarcasm is not an appropriate form of, of criticism, but in the time and culture of Paul, ironic sarcasm or even ironic ridicule, was an acceptable teaching technique. Therefore, with ironic barbs and taunting thrusts, Paul is humiliating the teaching that instructs Gentile believers to be circumcised and study the law. Instead, their experience of working miracles demonstrates more, much more. Paul humbles the teachers of the law, who are Jewish believers in Christ, reminding them that God has already supplied them with the Spirit and is working miracles among you. You foolish Galatians, Paul reprimands. This is the only thing I want to find out from you, says Paul, demanding before asking his rhetorical questions to which the Galatians know the silent answers by implication. Thus, Paul's letter to the Galatians describes a situation that prompted him to use methods of legal midrash to uncover deep meaning from scripture and to refute Jewish tradition. In the first century, Gentiles who were attracted to Judaism had to undergo circumcision and study of the law. But Gentiles in Galatia, who believed Yeshua was God's promised Messiah, were experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, both at the time of their initial belief in Yeshua the Messiah and also in their continuing walk of faith in Christ. So this bewildering circumstance prompted Paul's search for deeper meaning in Scripture, where he found compelling evidence that God had not only fulfilled his promise to bless the Gentiles through Abraham, but had also honored his promise of the Spirit. 
Now, we're, we're ready now to go into the Midrash, which I'm going to leave for the next uh, podcast. You can only take a little bit at a time. So I'll see you in the next podcast.